Tanisha Chappelle's needless death exposes the harsh realities of pre-trial detention in rural jail conditions. We need to dive into her family's pursuit of justice and the systemic failures that cost this young mother her life. Right, and you've probably never heard of this woman before, but her name was Tanisha Chappelle. She was from Louisville, Kentucky. She was 23 years old with a daughter, Nevea. According to her family, she loved to make people laugh. She was vibrant, outspoken. She saw the good in everybody. She's the type of person that would take a bullet for you, and I don't mean that metaphorically. She reportedly once laid on top of her boyfriend during a drive-by shooting, taking five bullets to the back, another time taking one to the arm protecting her daughter. But on the last day of her life, she spent hours begging for someone to just care about her. Right, in May of 2021, Tanisha was charged with theft and fleeing the police in Indiana. She was pulled over with her car matching the description of a vehicle involved in the theft of thousands of dollars in clothes. The officer there approaching her car with his gun pulled from its holster, trying to pull her from the vehicle. She then drives off and the police chase her before she's then pulled over again. And the officer, once again, approaches the car with his gun out, this time pointing it towards the car. Tanisha then takes off again and eventually veers into a ditch. She gets arrested and on her way in, she tells the cop why she drove off saying, you scared scared me with the aggression. As soon as I seen your gun, it scared me half to damn death. I was like, oh my gosh, he pulled a gun. My hands was out. He sees my hands. Why'd he pull his gun out on me? Tanisha was then taken to Jackson County Jail, which then failed to perform a medical screening on her despite it being required by state regulations. Eight days after her arrest, she was finally officially charged. The judge then setting her bail at $4,000 and her trial set for nearly six months later. Her family then tries to scrape together that bail money, but they're unable to make it. So Tanisha's just stuck in pre-trial detention where she's also the only black woman in her unit. She's ostracized. She faces racial slurs for weeks. And on July 5th, she starts getting sick. And all night, Tanisha calls on the intercom, begging for help. She was throwing up blood. She was dehydrated. She was growing more and more incoherent. And by the next day, she was just stumbling around, falling, hitting her head. The jail staff and nurse reportedly visiting herself several times, but no one makes a call to the hospital. And then after all of that, at 3 p.m. the next day, guards just find her lying naked on the floor and then ordering her to get dressed. With one sergeant telling her, this just makes us think you're faking it. If you're not going to get up and get dressed, we're just going to leave you alone. You can just sit there and suffer. With an ambulance not being called until 3.15 p.m. and Tanisha pronounced dead at the hospital at 5.45. And during those 19 hours that she was sick, her family was also never contacted with her sister later saying they had a duty to protect her. She wasn't attended to because she was a black woman and they didn't feel like she was worth getting any attention. Also, as far as how she died, that remains a mystery. Her autopsy were revealing a green liquid in her stomach and labeling her cause of death as probable toxicity. And some inmates saying that the prisoners had been putting a cleaning product into Nisha's food and drinks. So Indiana State Police investigated and said they found no evidence that she was poisoned by her fellow inmates or jail employees. And the prosecuting attorney announcing that there were no crimes committed and no charges would be filed. But Tanisha's family isn't ready to let her death be swept under the rug. With her mother launching a civil lawsuit against 13 jail employees and the sheriff for failing to provide adequate medical care for her daughter. Her family also starting the Justice for Tanisha movement, demanding not only federal prosecution, but the removal of the sheriff and jail employees involved in Tanisha's death. And that in addition to the removal of the license of the jail nurse. Also for those named, their depositions offer some answers about their inaction. Revealing what's been described as a general lack of knowledge about handling medical emergencies as well as several grievous miscommunications. And a really key thing to take away from this is this problem isn't just limited to Indiana. According to a 2021 study from the Vera Institute of Justice, rural counties incarcerate people at double the rate of urban areas despite having fewer resources. And rural jails like the one in Indiana where Tanisha was held suffer from the same problems that urban ones do overcrowding, understaffing, undertraining. But those problems are made even worse because they don't have the money to handle them. With an associate professor of criminology and justice studies at Drexel University in Philadelphia saying, fiscal pressures are an issue throughout corrections, but this can be especially true in smaller counties and jurisdictions where the tax base and public funding infrastructure tend to be more limited. This can translate to poorer conditions inside of jails and a failure to meet standards of correctional care. But also with Tanisha's case, an associate professor of criminal justice said it was all of those things and more, saying, it's an intersection of all sorts of awful things. Listing off pre-trial detention for people who can't afford to get out on bail, black people in southern Indiana being afraid of police officers, lack of health care, low education and pay for the correctional officers who are tasked with assessing people, saying many don't have the training, the education or the compassion. And as far as how Tanisha's story ends, we won't know for a little while. Their mother's lawsuit not set to go to trial until June 26, but we'll obviously keep our eyes on it. And in the meantime, let me know your thoughts in those comments down below. Also, if you or someone you know has any experience with local jail systems, whether it be on the employee side or the inmate side, please share your story. And then the future of equal access to knowledge is about to be decided thanks to this major copyright lawsuit that you probably have never heard about. Right, so at the center of it, you have Internet Archive. It's a nonprofit that was founded back in 1996 to build an internet library with the purpose of offering permanent access for researchers, historians, and scholars to historical collections that exist in digital format. And its offerings include films, audio recordings, text, educational items, and the Wayback Machine, which is a historical collection of billions of web pages. But the service in question today is its open library, which offers digital access to print books. Right, the Internet Archive uses what's known as controlled digital lending, which lets libraries lend one copy of a digitized item out to one borrower at a time, just like how a library works with physical books. But in March of 2020, when the pandemic closed libraries, people needed digital resources. So they expanded that program to a national emergency library. And the Internet Archive lifted waitlists, allowing multiple people to borrow the same digitized book at once, saying at the time that they received dozens of messages of thanks from teachers and school librarians for helping their students during this tremendous
tremendous and historic outage. And while some questioned if this was illegal, the Internet Archive argued, no, the books in the National Emergency Library have been acquired through purchase or donation, just like a traditional library. The Internet Archive preserves and digitizes the books it owns and makes those scans available for users to borrow online. And noting that, yes, it does traditionally follow that one-at-a-time rule, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And saying that rule is out the door until at least June 30th, 2020. But that wasn't a good enough answer for publishing groups who then hit Internet Archive with a lawsuit. That suit being led by Hatchet, Harper Collins, John Wiley and Sons, and Penguin Random House, and arguing that this was willful mass copyright infringement. So the Internet Archive cut its National Emergency Library program short. The lawsuits still move forward, with the publishers not just taking aim at the emergency library, but the Internet Archive's open library general practice of controlled digital lending. And since many libraries have adopted controlled digital lending in some way, that meant that this case could set the precedent for how copyright infringement applies to libraries lending digital books. And that's essentially what happened back in March when a judge sided with the publishers and dismissed the Internet Archive's arguments that this falls under fair use. But the Internet Archive is vowing to keep fighting, putting out a statement where it called the decision a blow to all libraries in the communities we serve, and adding this decision impacts libraries across the U.S. who rely on controlled digital lending to connect their patrons with books online, saying it hurts authors by saying that unfair licensing models are the only way their books can be read online, and it holds back access to information in the digital age, harming all readers everywhere. And its founder, Brewster Kale, adding, for democracy to thrive at global scale, libraries must be able to sustain their historic role in society, owning, preserving, and lending books. So the Internet Archive will be appealing to the decision. And interestingly, authors have had kind of mixed responses. The Authors Guild sided with the publishers saying that the Internet Archive's controlled digital lending is not fair use, saying it's theft and it devalues authors' works. But in September, a group of over 300 authors signed an open letter in support of the Internet Archive and libraries, actually asking publishers to drop the suit, with other Scott Carney saying, Libraries are a vital institution to cultivate engaged readers. Allowing them to carry books in formats that readers actually use only helps authors. Not allowing libraries to function puts the control of reading into the hands of big tech companies. Right, and that's a key thing, because while this case was specifically about the Internet Archive, like I mentioned at the top of this, this has much wider implications. With Bloomberg Law explaining, The unwavering rebuke of the online repository likely bars similar practices by libraries, attorneys favoring both sides said. And Julia M. Ziskina, a policy fellow at the Library Futures Institute, told the outlet that while libraries don't have to be concerned yet, they said it's a big blow and adding it really enforces that if libraries didn't already exist, they wouldn't be allowed to exist today. Now, it is also worth noting that controlled digital lending isn't the only way that libraries can get ebooks into the hands of readers, but as outlets like Vice have noted, licenses are costly, temporary, and ruin preservation efforts, which is also why one librarian told the outlet, what ends up happening is that libraries spend more of their money on licensing things that they don't own, which can be taken away at any time that are more expensive to begin with than buying hard copies in order to serve a segment of their population that uses ebooks and that you ended up with a much smaller selection of materials because the budget gets eaten so much faster. With Bloomberg Law is saying that this is why supporters of controlled digital lending say it simply advances the premise of libraries to the digital age. Some even going as far to say that with this case, publishers get one step closer to killing libraries. And that's not the only thing on the line here because the Internet Archive could actually lose billions in damages if it doesn't successfully fight this case, which is enough to threaten the existence of its other services, including the Wayback Machine, which is why we've seen tons of people speaking in support of it, saying that it is a crucial tool for history, journalism, information access, and more. But for now, we're going to have to wait Wait to see how things play out. And of course, in the meantime, let me know your thoughts in those comments down below. And then spring is here, which means days are longer. The weather is warming up. And let's face it, most of us don't want to spend any more time than we have to inside in the kitchen preparing meals. And that's why I want to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, HelloFresh. HelloFresh has taken the hassle out of mealtime this spring by delivering pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare recipes right to your door. No matter your lifestyle or meal preferences with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal items to choose from each week, this seriously saves time figuring out your week's meal menu. One of our favorite things about this service is that we're spending less time in the kitchen with quick and easy meals like HelloFresh's fast and fresh pineapple chicken tacos and falafel power bowls. I mean, these meals are ready in 15 minutes or less. And did I mention HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and most takeout? And here's another thing. HelloFresh isn't just for dinner. They've got you covered for every mealtime occasion from snacks and easy lunches to seasonal celebrations and festive gatherings. So make meals easier and better tasting by going to HelloFresh.com slash Phil50 and use code Phil50 for 50% off plus free shipping. You heard right. That's HelloFresh.com slash Phil50 and use code Phil50 to get you a ridiculous 50% off with free shipping. Honestly, it's a no-brainer to try America's number one meal kit today. And then, moral panics aren't new, but how they're now being weaponized to push agendas and distract people from real societal issues should concern you. If you watch my daily show with any regularity, you know just how much LGBTQ issues have taken center stage in American politics. For the past few years, how many times have you seen Republicans just frothing at the mouth about trans people, drag queens, whatever they want to label as wokeness that week? Which seems to be a puzzling amount of anxiety to be directed at a group that makes up just 1.6% of the population when it comes to trans and non-binary 
ordinary people. Politicians, talking heads, and social media have overinflated it to the point that in a survey last year, the average American guessed the share of trans people to be 21%. And it's this exaggeration of a smaller, often non-existent issue than the whipping up of the fear and hostility around that issue that makes us what sociologists call a moral panic. Right? It's a recurring phenomenon that pops up in different forms, with the satanic panic of the 80s being the most famous. That also being the one that inspired me to learn more about how they work. So to that end, I spoke with four experts, starting with Dr. Mary DeYoung, formerly a professor of sociology at Grand Valley State University. And she says that these moral panics, which come in reaction to perceived social change and confusion around morality and identity, are almost universally right-wing. Or just think about the big ones. You have witch hunts, red scare, the satanic panic. They had a certain regressive quality to them in that they were trying to restore something that people imagine were either lost or, or were being threatened. And she told us that as the conversations around different gender identities and sexual orientations enter the mainstream, some people feel like the traditional categories they identify with are being destabilized. So to alleviate this feeling, they deny the reality of these different identities. Right? And the targets and rationale, they're kind of just tweaks on each other. I think about conservatives saying trans people aren't real or it's all just a mental illness. Often the same people who say gay people are just making a choice or they're just confused. And instead, they blame an entity outside what they consider the in-group for introducing the confusion. Currently, a great example of that is the panic around teachers grooming students or kids going to drag queen story time, with the men in the end feeling like their own identity is still intact by expelling the other. Right, so that takes care of the identity confusion, but the moral confusion requires a different solution, which DeYoung argues is why children are so often made the object of anxiety, where the scene is pure and innocent, so their abuse is obviously morally unambiguous. Plus, that kind of self-certainty gives you permission to shut down any detractors. If you say, oh, I don't believe that, the response from somebody who does is, do you not care about kids? Do you not care about sexual abuse? With the young adding that this sense of moral clarity also feeds into a basic human need deep within our psyche. Most of us operate, I think, under a kind of fundamental assumption that social psychologists call the just world hypothesis, that there is order, there is morality, that people get what they deserve, whether for good acts or for bad acts. But you also have Dr. Michael Barbazet, a historian at the Australian Catholic University, offering a different explanation for this obsession with kids, saying children, being the next generation, essentially represent the future. So if you're afraid of where the future's headed, you're going to defend children. And supposedly, that fear is why moral panics tend to flare up at times of crisis or instability. With the same pattern repeating so often throughout history that experts actually coined a term for it, the nocturnal ritual fantasy. Right? In essence, it's this idea that shadowy groups secretly get together to worship forces of evil and ritualistically abused children. Historians will often say that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And this is one of those rhymes. It changes through time with the groups of people we don't like. So if you're an ancient Roman who's a pagan, you think Christians are doing this. If you're a medieval Christian, you think bad Christians are doing this, or Jews are doing this, or lepers are doing this, people your culture doesn't like. Later on in the Renaissance, you think witches are doing this. And in all of these cases, none of these people accused of it were doing it. If you read the sources for all of these supposed conspiracies, you'll be struck with how similar it seems, where you have these secret meetings. Sometimes they're underground. Sometimes they're in the woods. There will generally be, of course, invocations to evil. If it's Satan, if your culture believes in Satan, cats somehow get involved. People with dark skin somehow get involved. There's always some kind of freaky orgy for some reason and then they hurt kids. With the matting of this conspiracy appears again and again over centuries from sources that had no contact with one another, suggesting that it may just be hardwired into our culture. And in today's moral panic, you can see it most clearly in the QAnon movement. Right? They've got the global cabal, the perverse rituals, the child abuse, even a little Satanism thrown in there. But also despite the universal similarities, our moral panic has its own uniquely American origins. With Dr. Kyle Reismandel, a historian at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, explaining that the idea of childhood had to be constructed for these conspiracies to work at all. Coming out of the progressive era of the late 19th, century, the idea of childhood emerges, right? That like children are, are somehow innocent and therefore different than, you know, adults and eventually what are called teenagers, you know, because in the 19th century, early 20th century, children were working in mines and factories and contributed to the family economy on the farm, right? And then he says the idea of innocent children was placed in the suburbs. We're not talking like the literal geographic area between urban and rural that you can outline on a map. Rather, we're talking about these suburbs as an idea, a symbol or an image that's typically seen as the family-friendly home of American moral values. And after World War II, that space became racialized through policies like redlining, which kept black Americans from accessing mortgages. Meanwhile, the federal government subsidized home ownership for middle-class whites, making it cheaper to buy a house in the suburbs than the rent an apartment in cities like New York, Boston, or Philadelphia. And at the same time, men are returning back home from war to find women working traditionally masculine jobs, so they reestablish themselves as the head of the household. The idea of the breadwinner is a relatively recent invention. That's a post-word mention. And it's invented because men could go to work and afford 
right? Make enough money to have a household, provide all the consumer goods and have their spouse not work, right? And not work in the sort of paid sense or obviously working at home. So this all adds up to the popular image of a suburban family that's white, heteronormative, patriarchal, and Christian with a pure, innocent child at its center. But that image could only be maintained by creating an external threat. And this came first from radio, then from television, which introduced cultural products into the home that would supposedly corrupt children. And so then you got parents freaking out about their kids listening to rock music, watching explicit movies, playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the evil stuff. And then when you throw into the mix a late 70s economic crisis, racial integration, and the return of many women to work out of necessity, you can see how America was ripe for a moral panic, which of course is exactly what happened with Reagan defending so-called family values, Jerry Falwell conjuring the moral majority, and the media hyping up missing kids and poison Halloween candy. Meanwhile, rising single motherhood and divorce rates produce broken families and all the fucked up shit going on behind closed doors begins coming out into the open, where, key thing, it's labeled as trauma for the first time, as DeYoung explains. People often forget that it really wasn't until the 1980s uh, that the word trauma was used effectively and descriptively to talk about things that we had never talked about before that period of time. Child sexual abuse, incest, domestic violence, the fear of what the impact of all of this would have on children, particularly if children perhaps weren't really as well cared for as we imagined they were in previous generations caused a lot of unsettled feelings. So to cope with all this, the religious right makes the devil not only real, but responsible for people's distress, leading to the satanic panic in which dozens of people are actually convicted on cooked up charges, some of them even spending years in prison before being exonerated. But as a result, very big thing, all of the actual abuse and crimes being committed in churches, in schools, in the Boy Scouts, that goes unnoticed. One of the benefits is the, the structural arrangements of People in power and patriarchal privilege in that were really protected as we went running wild looking for these satanic abusers. Which is at the very least ironic because it means that the very thing the panic is about, right, the abuse of children is actually being swept under the rug by the panic itself. But arguably, that's also the entire point, to distract people not just from those individual crimes, but also the unpopular economic policies. And so today, that can look like Ron DeSantis waging his war on so-called wokeness. Meanwhile, you got the Florida's homeowner insurance market imploding as companies stop covering zip codes damaged by Hurricane Ian and premium skyrocket. And that's without mentioning the state consistently ranking near the bottom for healthcare, school funding, long-term elder care. You can also see this replicated at the federal level with Republicans harping on culture war issues while they cut taxes for the rich and cut funding for social programs. None of which, by the way, is new, right? Dr. Andrew Hartman, a historian at Illinois State University, says these culture wars have been going on since the beginning. Throughout the 19th century, the culture wars were often between the dominant Protestant groups um, who controlled most institutions, political and cultural institutions in the United States, especially the schools, and Catholics or Mormons or non-Protestant Christians. There have been these struggles throughout American history, but since the 1960s, these struggles have largely um, been between those who are liberal, progressive, secular. And then on the other side, um, these have been conservative Christian traditionalists who have imagined an American identity rooted in a more distant past. So Hartman says that since then, while the left has made real progress on cultural issues like racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia, the right has also used the reactionary backlash against the progress to push through their economic agenda, which creates this really weird dilemma, right? Because when Republicans attack a marginalized group, you have a choice. Either push back against them, in which case you're fighting on their terms and the economic issues and all the other issues recede into the background, or you ignore them and you focus on the economy where they don't have a leg to stand on, in which case you're just leaving those marginalized people out to dry. So how to navigate this situation is a question activists have been debating for decades. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to settle that. But I did ask the young, how can we deflate this moral panic? And she recommends interrupting the cycle of fear, and to do so with some Socratic questioning to nudge people toward critical thinking. Though there, even she's pessimistic, saying it'll probably just collapse under its own weight like the satanic panic did, though not entirely disappear. Instead, going dormant and then flaring up 10 or 20 years from now wearing different clothing. Sexy food. He's not sexy, sexy, feel he's a sexy 